using me. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really honored and pleasured to see so many people interested in uh, uh, Anglo-Russian relationships and uh, the reception of Marina Tsvetaeva in Britain. In uh, my talk uh, will be divided into two parts. The first one will be a brief outline of the history of the reception of Marina Tsvetaeva in Britain. And the second one, the less boring one, will be devoted uh, to uh, comparison of uh, uh, the uh, original poem written by Tsvetaeva and called An Attempt at Jealousy and uh, uh, Ellen Feinstein's translation of the same poem into English. So uh, the outline, let's start with the outline. Uh, the first introduction of Marina Tsvetaeva in Britain took place in 1924. I'm speaking about the anthology by Sviatopolk Mirsky and his history of Russian literature, where he wrote about the poet, well, actually not very favorably. The situation changed in 1926. Tsvetaeva visited London and had two poetry readings there mainly for the Russian emigrants, of course, uh, because she didn't speak any English and uh, uh, the reading audience in Britain didn't speak Russian. But in 1926, Mirsky has changed his opinion about Svitaeva, and we can easily see it from his article for Slavonic Review, where he put Svitaeva next to Mayakovsky, Gumilov, and Pasternak. And a bit later, he even called her a genius. That was a stage that laid the groundwork of future interest to Tsvetaeva's personality and poetry that emerged among the British intellectual readers in the second half of the 20th century. The second impulse was the publication in the West in 1950s of Tsvetaeva's poetry, prose, and letters in Russian, as well as autobiographic prose by Pasternak, where he highly praised Tsvetaeva's talent. Another notable milestone was the research, and we can see it in the slide, in the first slide. Can you show it, Anna? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, was the research by Simon Karlinsky, which appeared in 1966 and was published by the University of California, but became known in Britain as well. The main focus of the research was the tragic life of Marina Tsvetaeva, who was not accepted by her peers on both sides of the Iron Curtain and died in obscurity. Karlinsky's research provoked new surveys and set two mainstream directions of exploration in Svitaeva studies. The first one, life and work of the poet. It has become the main bulk of the research work. And the second one, Svitaeva's artistic innovation as a poet. The discovery of Svitaeva in the West coincided with the late discovery of the poet in Russia. In 1961, the first academic edition of her selected poems was published. In 1970s, 1980s, Joseph Brodsky was doing a lot to popularize Tsvetaeva in the United States, though in Russian. In 1986, the correspondence of Tsvetaeva, Pasternak, and Rilke was published in English. Since 1970s, the status of Tsvetaeva in the English speaking world has started to change, uh, to change judging by the kind of information given by the publishers for book covers. If earlier she herself needed to be introduced to the readers, now she often uh, was used as a cultural context, helpful to identify other Russian poets. For example, on a book with Feinstein's translation, uh, translations of the younger Russian writers, 
such as Margarita Aliger, Yuna Moritz, and Bella Ahmadulina, these poets are presented with a reference to Tsvitaeva, which means that the readers are supposed to be acquainted with her work. In the late 80s, can we see the next slide, please? In Britain and the United States, several biographies of Marina Tsvitaeva were published. They're both printed in the slide. The books by Kalinsky and Feinstein triggered great response in British and American press, not only in scientific periodicals like Slavonic and This European Review, World Literature Today, Russian Literature Three, Quart three Quarterly, but in Times Literary Supplement and Spectator. So we can say that in the 1980s, Tsvetaeva became known in Britain beyond the narrow circle of literary critics. It was the time of her popularization in the English speaking world. For example, in this period, her illustrated biography was published in the United States. In 1986 in Britain, the Cotswold Theater staged a play called Marina Tsvetaeva, a poet and an outcast. Feinstein wrote a radio play about Vogt's life and the British television released a documentary about the Russian poet. As for the professional readers, the research activity in the 80s mostly developed in the United States. However, in the United Kingdom in this period, two books appeared where Tsvetaeva was for the first time depicted as a part of the Russian literary tradition. I mean the books they are already mentioned in the slide by Ronald Hingley and Peter Franz. Hingley in his book stated, I quote, the evidence of vogue now enjoyed by the 20th century poetry, end quote. Reviewers and influential literary critics like Ruth Padel, for example, noted, quote, a resonant impact, unquote, of the Russian poets in the European and American poetry in the Cold War period. Sure, we need to keep in mind that the Vogue was limited by a narrow circle of academics and intellectuals, so we cannot speak about the popularity of Tsvetaeva. Lawrence Venuti, a prominent American translation theorist, rightly noted in his book, The Translations and Visibility, that foreign literature in translation is not very much popular in Britain in general and hardly ever became a bestseller. In the 90s, the interest to Tsvetaeva was still high due to her centennial anniversary. And here, such a significant event should be mentioned as the Festival Poetry International, where 12 women poets from the UK and the US read their translations of Tsvetaeva's poems, and the Russian actress Alla Demidova read the originals. Those who were present noted the well-bred character of translations as compared to the violent impact of the originals. In this period, can we see the next slide, please? A series of important publications connected with Tsvetaeva was published in English. So you can see uh, translations of some of her biographies, which were of a great impact at that period of time and later. Uh, late 20th, uh, early 21st century was marked by the appearance of a series of PhD theses on the Russian poet again, predominantly in the United States. Alexandra Smith, a Tsvetaeva scholar from London University, at least at that time she worked at, at London University, labeled, and, and she herself wrote uh, a thesis on, on Marina Tsvetaeva, labeled the previous stage of Tsvetaeva's reception as an ecstatic one. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so this, period, the ecstatic one, provoked active publication of the poet's writing in the English-speaking world. At the turn of the century, 
the time of scholars and serious investigation of Tsvetaeva's work has come. As I have already mentioned, in the reception of Marina Tsvetaeva in Britain and in the English speaking world in general, one can easily see two major trends. One puts the main stress on the poet's life, full of terrible hardships, describing her as a victim of the Russian Revolution and the Stalin's regime. Uh, we can find the evidence in the, uh, even in the titles of the articles devoted uh, to the Russian poets. Uh, a poet's tragedy, the tragic life of Marina Tsvetaeva, for want of a nail, skinned alive, and so on and so forth. The second trend investigates Tsvetaeva's poetic diction and innovative versification. Well, uh, uh, works of, of that kind are much uh, less numerous, less numerous uh, than the works of the first kind. And as far as versification is concerned, well, I'm afraid I can name only one uh, written by Gerald Smith and called Compound Meters in the Poetry of Marina Tsvetaeva. So uh, investigations on versification, uh, Tsvetaeva's versification, are not, not very popular, popular in Britain um, as compared to uh, Russia, where it is one of the most popular subjects uh, for uh, scholarly investigations. As for the history of translations, uh, it could become a topic of a separate talk, but to put it in a nutshell, Peter Franz in the Oxford Guide to Literature in English Translation argues that most of the Russian poets of the beginning of the last century became known in Britain in the second half of the century. That is true about Svetaeva as well. As most of her work was translated in the second half of the last century. Of course, some singular translations appeared earlier, but Svetaeva was less lucky in this respect than Akhmatova or Pasternak or Mandelstam. The reason a number of them. Let me mention only a couple of the most significant ones. The very character of her poetry does not fit into the English literary tradition. Since Thomas Stearns Eliot's objective chorality theory and the new criticism, the English poetic tradition has been aimed rather at producing witty, unexpected development of a poem's theme than expressing emotion. While Russian poetry is mostly focused on expressing feelings, so to say the drama of the persona. Plus, Russian and English versification has been developed in different directions, and Tsvetaeva's innovations in this sphere hardly can be rendered without a significant loss. So can we see the next slide, please? Uh, in the 60s, only some of her short poems from different periods were translated. So you see that mainly her poems appeared in anthologies. Well, six or three, uh, so Meryl Sparks translated 13 poems. So that's, that's not very much. And that was uh, a beginning in the 60s. By, by the way, Obolinsky and Sparks both translated an attempt at jealousy we're going to discuss today. So Ellen Feinstein's translation is not the only one. In the 70s, short poems plus part of some narrative poems, for example, the rat catcher, poem of the end, poem of the hill, uh, started to be translated. The growth of translation in this period was a result of the interest to Tsvetaeva's work due to research and biographies published. Uh, so uh, you can see in, in, in the next slide those works uh, of Tsvetaeva, no, uh, which were uh, translated and published in this period. So in 1971 uh, appeared uh, for the first time uh, the book called Selected Poems of Marina Tsvetaeva by uh, Ellen Feinstein, translated by Ellen Feinstein. And uh, since that time, it has had more than five editions. So it really became a bestseller. And you know, you, you already heard the opinion of Lawrence Venuti 
that uh, it's, it's very difficult for uh, a translated book to become a bestseller. So it seems to be an exception from, from the common rule. Uh, but uh, also appeared some other very uh, good translations. Well, for example, um, uh, my students, they preferred the translations made by David uh, Macduff uh, to the translations made by Ellen Feinstein because they are more close uh, to the original um, from the point of view of versification. But it didn't, uh, it didn't uh, work well uh, for the British uh, audience, evidently. All right. So since the 90s, early uh, 2000s, the time of selected cycles, narrative poems, and prose has started. An unusual experiment uh, took place in 1993 and was published in Poetry Review. Uh, uh, this journal uh, printed 13 poems translated, uh, 13 poems of Tsvitaya were translated by different women poets. And uh, the experiment was called 13 Ways of Looking at Tsvitaya, uh, which was a witty reference to 13 Ways of Looking at a Blackbird by Wallace Stevens, of course. So the translators were uh, you know, prominent poets uh, from, from the US and uh, the UK, like Wendy Cope, Anne Stevenson, Carolyn Duffy, Sarah Maguire, Kathleen Jammy, and some others. Also in the 90s, can we see the next slide, please? Uh, some books uh, in the United States and uh, UK uh, were published, um, and, and these were translations of um, uh, different Svitaeva's cycles. In the 2010s, one can detect a new tendency. Can we see the next slide, please? A British writer and a translator, Christopher White, sequentially renders Tsvitaeva's work cycle by cycle. So probably quite soon we will have a complete poems of Tsvitaeva published. So in the slide you can see uh, those books or in, in those cycles he, he, uh, he has already rendered. It, it's rather books than cycles uh, which are named in the slide. Uh, so uh, he, he really does, does it sequentially cycle after cycle. And, and that's very exciting, of course. So, so far so good. That was the brief outline of the history of Marina Tsvitaeva's reception. And now let's switch to a more fascinating thing, the comparative analysis of Tsvitaeva's poem and its translation into English by Ellen Feinstein, which became a real classics. So, can we see, Anna, the text of the poems? I hope it is readable <clears throat> and visible. Yeah, good, all right. So, Marina Tsvitaeva's poem represents an inner conversation with her ex-lover. The speaker is trying to imagine what his life with another woman might be like. The title of the poem conveys that the persona does not feel any jealousy as she might feel. It is a more intricate feeling suggesting involvement and compassion for the man who left her for someone else. The ex-lovers' soul, uh, ex souls are called sostri, sisters. It stresses a deeper relationship between them uh, than a banal love affair. It is a spiritual blood relationship. Duši, duši, byť vam sestrami, ne ljubovnicami vam. Literally, souls, souls, you will be sisters, not lovers. The opposition in this line is pivotal for Tsvetaeva's artistic world as well as for the Russian culture in general, where the opposition soul versus body, uh, which means more or less spiritual versus material, 
<clears throat> plays an important part. Anna Vizhbitska, one of the major experts in the matters of reflection of the Russian cultural world in the Russian language, claims that dusha is one of the three major Russian concepts alongside with taska, well, yawning for want of a better translation, and sudba, fate. Uh, the word dusha is treated in the Russian culture as a moral and emotional core of a human being and is one of the key values in the Russian mentality. In translation, it is substituted by spirit. Spirits, spirits, you will be sisters and never lovers. This uh, substitution distorts the architectonics of the source text and sets a different um, uh, opposition more comprehensible to the British mind. According to Svetlana Terminasova, it is an expert on uh, uh, Russianness and Englishness uh, in, uh, um, in Russia. And she was actually a person who uh, was the founding mother, let's put it so, uh, of the faculty at the Moscow State University, which initially was called uh, the Faculty of uh, Foreign Languages and Intercultural Communication. Uh, so uh, she argues uh, that in the Russian language, dusha, soul, is opposed to tela, body, while for the English language, the dichotomy mind versus body is pertinent. The strong moral component of the Russian concept dusha establishes the main leitmotiv of Tsvitaeva's poem, based on the juxtaposition of high and low. Duchovne versus Poshle. Vizbitska views the word Poshli, Poshlist, as a very meaningful one for the Russian culture and hardly translatable into any other language. So, in, in one of the uh, Russian English dictionaries compiled by Smirnitsky, uh, the ways to translate the word Poshlist are vulgarity, platitude, triviality, banality. None of them, however, fully conveys the definition given in the Russian explanatory dictionary by Ozhegov. Well, I will quote in Russian because it is very difficult uh, even, even uh, to, uh, to, to translate even the definition into English. Niski в духовном отношении, мелкий, ничтожный, заурядный. Uh, so it is more or less low uh, from the spiritual point of view, shallow, uh, not important, commonplace. The ethical connotation set by the concepts dusha and poshlist transforms the love theme in Svitaeva's poem into an issue best described as, again, the Russian word, sorry for that, bit i bitie. Philistine existence versus intensive spiritual life, disdain for commonplaceness. And it is easily recognizable by any representative of Russian intelligentsia. Another enigmatic word. The images of the poem associated with the speaker reflect the speaker's uniqueness as being out of this world. She is a floating island in the sky, not on the waters. She is the sacred Mount Sinai, God hewn from Carrara marble, sovereign deposed from the throne. Additional overtones of the speaker's image may be traced indirectly via the description of her rival, uh, who is identified as prastaya женщина без шестых чувств an ordinary woman without sixth sense. Чужая, здешняя, stranger from this world. Товар рыночный, a piece of market stuff. Сто тысячная, one of a thousand women. Stranger, oh, no, 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 uh, любая, anyone. These descriptions stress the exclusive and exceptional nature of the persona. 
as for the image of the ex-lover, he is depicted as an exceptional man as well. Tsvitaeva uses the word izbranny, which means a chosen one. This word means the best one, standing out from the crowd, privileged. Thus, the former lover is depicted as a person equal to the speaker. It is not by chance that their souls will always be sisters, despite the breakup. The woman whom he left the persona for is called Chujaya, a stranger, in the sense alien to him in spirit. Tsvitaeva refers to the Bible to illustrate the equality of the speaker and her ex-lover. They, Adam and Lilith, are both primal, while the rival identified with Eve is secondary. The speaker of Tsvitaeva's poem reproaches her lover not for leaving her for another woman. The rival is depicted as such an insignificant creature that the very idea to be jealous of her is irrelevant. The ex-lover is reproached for giving up the lofty destiny when he stepped down the throne he had shared with the speaker. All the imagery of the poem connected with today's life of the ex-lover revolves around the details associated in the Russian culture with the Philistine existence. Свойственнее и съедобнее снять. Приезца не пеняй. More usual, more to your taste, is it, your food? If you get bored with it, do not moan. Рыночную новизною сыпили. Literally, are you sated with a new product in the marketplace? Как живется вам с товаром рыночным? How is your life with a piece of market star, etc.? Eventually, the former lover moves not horizontally, but vertically down when he is abandoning the persona of the poem. He steps down the throne, walks down Sinai, after spiritual heights, finds himself in a place described as a shallow cleft. In the Russian original, Praval bez glubin. The image used by Tsvitaeva is semantically heavy. In Russian, the word Praval means not only a cleft, but also a failure. So in the poem, both meanings are actualized simultaneously. The breakup with the speaker is shown as a failure of the man who abandoned her. In Russian, the word glubini, literally depths, like visoty, literally heights, is associated with spirituality. This image, so important in Tsvitaeva's poem, is overlooked by the translator, as the latter uh, constructs her poem using a different opposition. We will speak about this opposition a bit later. She translates в провале без глубин as in a shallow pit, an expression completely deprived of the moral and ethical connotations of the original. The speaker in the source text feels pity for the former lover. He, an unusual man, failed to withstand the high pressure of spiritual existence, gave up his lofty mission. Thus, he was doomed to suffer, bogged down in the bourgeois mire, and be ashamed and have a bad conscience. Спошлиной бессмертной пошлости, как справляетесь, бедняк? How do you cope with the tax of deathless banality? Triviality, vulgarity, poor man. Стыд зевесовой вожою не охлёстывает лба. Does not shame weep your forehead with Zeus's reins. Even though the English word shame and consciousness reflect the meanings of the Russian equivalents, they do not convey the emotional overtones of стыд and совесть in the Russian culture, where these moral values are emphasized. In the original, the words stit and sovist uh, reinforce the key opposition of the poem, spiritual heights versus shallow Philistine existence. In the translation, not supported by this dichotomy, they lose their relevance. Now let's speak about the translation. 
uh, since we more or less understand or know what Svitaeva meant, let's see what happens uh, when the, uh, um, the poem is rendered into English. At the first glance, Feinstein's translation looks a literal one, well, just word for word, nearly word for word translation. However, a more careful reading discovers that it is a mere reframing, a reframing of Tsvitaeva's text as it changes its very message. As it was pointed out earlier, the key opposition of the original is spirituality, creativity, marked by a strong positive connotation and associated with a persona of the poem versus commonplaceness and earthliness of everyday existence, marked by a strong negative connotation and related to the persona's rival. This type of opposition is characteristic of Tsvitaeva's personal view of the world, as well as the uh, Silver Age of uh, Russian poetry and the Russian system of values in general. In the translation, the key opposition is replaced by the high social status of the persona versus the low social status of the persona's rival, which is unthinkable for Tsvitaeva. However, it is perfectly in line with a British system of values known for its strong class structure awareness described by several British authors in the 20th century, uh, including Orwell and Priestley. Of course, you may argue that today it is not like it was in the beginning of the 20th century, but still, uh, Kate Fuchs, for example, a social anthropologist in her recent book called Watching the English argues that, uh, quote, class consciousness is still there, especially uh, if you compare it to the situation in Russia. In Russia. Uh, the switch of the oppositions. Yes, and uh, here I would like to tell you a funny story. How actually I detected that uh, in translation, the message is completely different. Uh, uh, I was getting ready for, for a talk, for a conference, and suddenly realized that I cannot use the original because people did not, my audience, well, did not speak any, any, any Russian. So I had to uh, look for a good translation, and I decided to stick to Ellen Feinstein's translation of the poem An Attempt at Jealousy, because it looked to me very, very close to the original. And uh, uh, I was discussing some uh, subtleties uh, of the English text with uh, my friends. Uh, well, I had very good friends of mine, unfortunately, both, both had gone already. Uh, he was a professor of physics and a very knowledgeable person, and his wife was very knowledgeable as well, and she was very much interested in uh, uh, Russian literature and in Marina Tsvitaeva in particular. So we were discussing the poem, and suddenly he said, I don't like your Tsvitaeva. Why? <laughs> was the question. Uh, he said, she resembles so much my ex-wife. The only thing I knew about about his ex-wife was that uh, she, she belonged to uh, the English aristocracy. So I decided to work out what triggered that impression. Because uh, uh, as I have already said, uh, well, it is unthinkable uh, in, in, Svitaeva's, in Svitaeva's poem, uh, you cannot uh, find any trace of uh, uh, this aristocratic attitude, right? It is totally different because Tsvitaeva did not belong to an arist uh, Rus uh, did, did not belong to Russian aristocracy. She she belonged to what we call Russian intelligentsia. Her father was uh, a university professor, and by the way, he, he was a founder uh, of. Uh, 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 one of the best museums of fine arts in, in Russia, uh, the, one, the one named after Pushkin in Moscow. And uh, her mother was uh, a very good pianist uh, in, in, uh, in her youth, and uh, later, later she became a housewife. So they were not aristocrats, and the spirit of the family uh, was not 
uh, aristocratic at all. So uh, we both uh, tried, uh, my friend and I, we tried to find out what triggered that impression in, in, the, in the translated poem. And we came to a conclusion that uh, the switch of the uh, oppositions was triggered by Feinstein's translation of the Russian word Porschlist, marked with strong ethical overtones as vulgar, associated in English with low social origins. All the rest of the transformations amazingly built into the new opposition. Even the vertically organized space of the poem starts to support it. With the speaker, the ex-lover was on the throne in the skies on Mount Sinai. Now, when he stepped down, he found himself in a shallow pit. The speaker's high social status is enhanced by the image of sovereign deposed. The rival's low social status is emphasized by the expression an ordinary woman. The metaphor of Carrara marble also acquires a new meaning as a precious and expensive work of art and is opposed to the images of dust of plaster and a piece of market stuff at a steep price used to describe the rival. Even the lack of exclamation marks abundant, abundant in Svitaeva's poetry creates a fundamentally new persona with a recognizably British stiff upper lip attitude. At the level of imagery, it is supported with such metaphors uh, as stone, marble, sinai, with their potential connotation of coldness, self-restraint, and unreproachability or unapproachability. It's better to say. The image of the ex-lover undergoes a significant transformation as well. In the original, the speaker reflecting about the ex-lover's life with another one uses impersonal grammar structures. Как живется вам с другою? Как живется вам хлопочется? Ёжится, встаётся как? Как живется вам? Здоровится, можется, поётся как? In Feinstein's translation, the personal constructions of the original are converted into the personal ones. Well, because, because the English language does not allow to use the kind of constructions uh, which were used by Tsvitaeva. How is your life with another one? How is your life? Are you fussing, flinching? How do you get up? How is your life? Are you healthy? How do you sing? Svitaeva chooses these type of sentences to stress the character's passiveness, submission to his fate. He does not manage his life. Life is happening to him. Hence, he stepped down the, thro the throne because he felt powerless against outer impersonal forces, yielded to temptation in a moment of weakness. This urges the persona feel compassion for the ex-lover and there, rather than to judge him. Feinstein's uh, character appears to be rather proactive and self-sufficient. The persona and your former lover look in her poem much more independent from one another, despite the affinity of their souls uh, proclaimed in the second stanza. These transformations in the characters of the poem are enhanced in translation by the change of punctuation marks. Refraining from exclamation marks, for example, and dashes, the hallmark of Tsvitaeva's work. It makes a Russian speaking reader perceive the striking gap between the intonation of the translation and that of the original. The latter, uh, an attempt at jealousy turns uh, into love pity love compassion for the uh, for the ex-lover while in the translation irony and scorn dominate i'm afraid the lack in the translation of uh, syllabic tonic rhythm as well as rhyme so crucial for Tsvitaeva's poetics is also perceived by a russian reader as a considerable loss to avoid the undesirable effect 
the translator had to omit the feature of the source uh, text because rhyme in contemporary British poetry is strongly associated with comic verse. Feinstein uses lowercase letters at the beginning of lines where grammar does not require capitalization. She breaks the rule which was absolute for the 19th century uh, poetry, uh, but is often neglected in contemporary English speaking poetry and via this domesticates and modernizes the origin. And by the way, the English speaking readers uh, responses show that this technique appeals to them very much. The Russian students' responses uh, shows that Russian speaking readers mostly see Feinstein's translation as a failure. While in the English speaking world, this translation is believed to be a resounding success. Uh, this is best illustrated, by the way, by the article about 29 female poets published in 1999 in the Independence on Sunday, where Ellen Feinstein is represented not by her own piece of writing, but by an attempt at jealousy. So it shows that uh, this poem reads very well in English and appeals to the British readers. It is a real work of art. Uh, however, in my opinion, from the reception studies perspective, the core question concerning translations are, what sort of target text transformations took place? What triggered those transformations and how they affected the meaning and the impact of the origin? In broader terms, what images an author acquires, images or maybe masks, it, it is even better to say, an author acquires in the process of being translated into different literary traditions of the huge field of world literature. Today, we have got acquainted uh, with one of the images Marina Tsvitaeva acquired in Britain. Thank you for attention. I will be glad to answer your questions. Yeah, there are some. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marina, for your talk. We, um, so yes, if you have any questions, you can just unmute yourself and start speaking, or you can uh, put some questions in the chat and I will read them. Um, so while the audience is thinking, I have a question about Svetopol Mirsky. Yes. I, I was really interested uh, about Svetayeva's visit in, in yeah. England, in London, I assume. Um, so what was the reason for her visit? And I'm also curious if Svetopol Mirsky tried to somehow initiate the projects for translation uh, of Svetayeva's poetry okay. as he did with uh, some other Russian works. Um, so, yeah, can, can you can you tell a bit more about this? Yes, th thank you very much, Anna. Actually, Svetopol Mirsky was the one who initiated Svetayeva's visit to Britain. Mm -hmm. And she, she gave only two readings. And unfortunately, well, you see, the audience was not numerous because uh, not, uh, she, she was not popular among the Russian immigrants at, at that time. And uh, the British audience didn't know about Svitaeva and didn't, didn't speak any English. So unfortunately, well, it was a very, uh, no, not very significant event, but Svetopol Mirsky met Svitaeva in person. He was impressed. And since that time, he started to be interested in, in her poetry. Uh, well, I cannot, I cannot tell for sure that he initiated some of her translations. I guess so, right? But unfortunately, I cannot name uh, which, which translations were initiated uh, by Svetopol Mirsky. Sorry, mm -hmm. sorry. Okay. If, I, if I find some evidence, I will let you know. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. Yes, yes. Yes, please unmute, unmute yourself. We can't, we can't hear you, Maria. Yes. I'm so sorry. My name is Maria Shevtsova. Yes. I'm a theater specialist. Um, 
And I very, very, and I'm a great lover of Marina Tsvitaeva. So I was very thrilled to be able to come this and thank you for what I have found to be a truly marvelously subtle and profound uh, lecture. Thank you. It's been a, an thank enormous you. pleasure to listen to you. Um, let me just say very briefly that you touched on everything I have discovered myself. My most recent book is called Rediscovering Stanislavski. I see. And I have found in my working closely from the Russian into the various English translations, exactly the same problems that you have found. Interestingly enough, the emphasis in Stanislavski is always on feeling yeah. and in translation. So it's called the best one, which was 10 years ago. Um, the word is mind. It is never feeling. Yeah. So do you see there is a cultural predisposition here? Absolutely. Absolutely. And the whole problem of translation, as we know, is not just dictionary equivalence. It is really deeply rooted in cultural nuances. Yeah. And you brought them out very beautifully. It did occur to me as you were speaking and raising the question about the Englishman who didn't like his aristocratic wife. <laughs> ex-wife, ex-wife. Ex -wife. Well, that's why she became ex. It did <laughs> occur to me to ask you this or to comment on this, to have, you, to have your response to it. You see, I think you very rightly pointed out to the class dimension of the man's distaste for Svitaeva. Yeah. i.e. he sees it in terms of his aristocratic wife's class position. Am I right? Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I want, something else struck me, not so much the class position, but I think what your talk pointed out and what I certainly feel about Svitaeva's tremendous moral spine, her moral backbone is so strong. It's daunting for lesser mortals in many respects. But you see, there is a concept among the British aristocracy of being on the high moral ground. I see. You would know this expression, but certainly in the aristocratic circles, to have a high moral ground comes with the social position. Or should come with the social yeah. position rather within an ideal world, because there are many rake aristocrats. We aristocrats, we know that we don't. We, you know, we we don't have Hogarth necessarily to prove it to us. So I was just thinking, you know, the idea of the dusha paruski does very much involve the notion of moral strength and fortitude. It does, there is no getting yes. away from it. It is built into the cultural process. And I'm just wondering whether that isn't part of Feinstein's problem in translation, that she hasn't caught the great significance of the moral high ground. And this gentleman did without knowing it, so to speak. <laughs> And I'm just wondering whether, as a translator and as a scholar of translation, what you would think to my proposition that this aspect of the high moral ground be examined a little more in the problem of translation of Tsvitaeva. Not only because it's linked so strongly to the notion of dusha, therefore to the notion of soul, as we would say in English, but because the high moral ground is very much part of the rock-like quality of her poetry itself. Yeah. Does this make sense to you? Am yes, I it does. Out of order? It does. It's uh, actually, it's a big issue, so to say. Well, you see, what, what to prefer? Domesticate or foreignize? So uh, what uh, Ellen Feinstein uh, did, uh, and, and I think uh, she did a really great job, uh, she domesticated Svitaeva, right? Yes. yes. But, uh, and, uh, and probably, uh, so from the point of view of uh, reception and then from the point of view of the world literature, it is good. Because, well, people, some people fell in love with Svitaeva. Well, I know quite, quite a lot of English people, English intellectuals, who read Svitaeva in Feinstein's translation and they fell in love with, with the poet. Um, well, unfortunately, we, the Russians, right, we see that that, that is not Svitaeva at all. Yes. But it works. 
it but works. Works. And from the point of view of reception, well, probably uh, uh, the fact that, uh, well, a piece of poetry is domesticated is not bad. Well, for example, what uh, what uh, happened to Pushkin, right? When Nabokov translated it with commentaries, because that's the only way out. You need to give commentaries and commentaries and commentaries, right? On right. every every specific cultural value. But then it doesn't work as a work of art. It's but, very good for professionals. But this is precisely the point I would like to make yeah. for, for putting it in those terms. You know, I used the word rock for. Tsvetaeva quite deliberately. I didn't say yeah. marble. I didn't say yeah. marble. I said rock. I didn't say stone. I mean rock. She's like granite rock. And that is part of the power of her versification. It is part of the power of the rhythm, the tone, and the heart and soul of the poetry. So yes, I take your point very much about domestication. But you know, what do we do when you can't domesticate rock? Yeah. <laughs> so the more translations you have, the better of different <laughs> kinds. <laughs> That's my answer. That's okay. my answer. It's, it's so every answer. reader, then every reader might choose what he or she prefers. Yes. Closer to the original, right? An understanding of Svetaeva's uh, well soul, so to say, and Russian soul in general, or uh, a work of art which appeals to your English soul, so to say. <laughs> The problem, of course, is one of <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm going to stop because I don't want to colonize this session. You know, I almost feel like an interloper here, but you know, um, my interest in Russian culture runs deep. So why not have an interloper like me? Uh, and I'm a member of this group anyway. But my, my point is the problem does arise, doesn't it? Of the diminishment of the stature of a writer when it's domesticated and uh, it might please the heart and soul of the, of the audience within the domesticated culture. But there is something perhaps to be said about a distortion of meaning in all this. I found this with Stanislavski. Why we have such appalling ideas about Stanislavski is precisely Precisely because he was diminished to something domestic. And actually, guess what? I discovered he was far bigger than this. He's a colossus. And it's precisely because not in translation, that quality emerges. In translation, it becomes just mind, just reason, just naturalism, just all those things for which Stanislavski is known, in my view now, today, wrongly. Do you see? I start using words like wrongly. I see, I see. But by the way, the same happened to Shakespeare in Russian. Oh, yes. It is I diminished. Know. It is diminished. I do know that. I have read the Shakespeare in Russian to see. Yes, yes. So at least it is a revenge. <laughs> well, I don't know. It's just an impossible task to be a translator. Perhaps that's what we have to cook. <laughs> Or probably it wasn't the time. Thank you. I, I found that most wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your question, for your observations, Maria. We have a question from Janet. Um, would you like to read it yourself or shall, shall I do this? Okay, probably I will read it then. Oh, read it out if you like. Okay, 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 please, please do. Okay, so, so I'll, have, I'll, have I'll a live conversation. Straight, straight from it, so I have the words straight. So um, I said, oh, first of all, thank you very much, Marina, for a very interesting talk. Um, it's very interesting what you've said about the tone of pity and compassion um, mm -hmm. in the original compared to the tone of what you've called scorn and irony in the translation. And um, what I wanted to know is whether you agree that despite what you've said, there is an element of at least a mock haughtiness um, that, that the poet uses to maybe cover her feelings of anger and anguish at having been rejected, particularly as his, his new lover is so beneath her, um, which in the last line, she reveals to be mock the attempt um, that, that perhaps is in the title. And so she reveals in the last line, I thought what her true feelings are, um, or, or if I sort of misread the Russian in that. Uh -huh. you, you mean the original or the translation? Well, I, I read Russian as well. Russian as so, well? Yeah, so I, I'm, I mean, 
my sense of the Russian was mm -hmm. that there is an element of anger and what I've called haughtiness um, in the, well, well, I did think there was even a bit, an element of sarcasm. Um, certainly she's taunting him for having taken on a woman who is so inferior to her and as you've explained to him as well. Um, but as far as the tone goes, I, I hear that, maybe wrongly, that, that sort of haughtiness and anger towards him, which at the very end, in that soft line, uh -huh. where she says, my love, you know, and I think she uses in Russian. Sorry, I haven't got the text in front of me now. Um, that she reveals, this is really, you know, she, she may be angry and she may want to, to express how, um, what a mistake he's made, but above all, you know, you know, underneath all of that, there is just that sorrow as well and, and um, loss. Or have I, mis have I misinterpreted that tone? Jenna, thank you very much for your question. So it is, uh, I, I think it is uh, impossible to misinterpret a piece of writing, right? Uh, every, everyone interprets it as he or she can or feels like. So you see, uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, well, I don't feel any anger or any mockery in, in, in the Russian in, in the okay. Russian text. Let's let's ask Anna. She's also a native speaker. So what does she feel? Let's collect the opinions. Mm -hmm. uh, well I personally I, I think there is some anger in this um, in this poem because obviously she was she was loved but I understand your idea of this vertical um, line and that it's not only anger but so pity, which she feels towards her ex-lover, um, is something which she somehow nourish instead of his uh, instead of her anger. So this mm -hmm. comes as a um, yeah as, as a as a substitution to anger. So not to feel mm -hmm. anger, she somehow inspires herself to feel uh, pity. Mm -hmm. That's how. That's yes, I understand what you're saying. Mm. And, and you see, uh, again, love, uh, pity is uh, something very specific to, to the Russian culture, like dusha. Well, I, I'm afraid people from other cultures just do not understand how you can feel pity and love at the same time. But Russian women know <laughs> that it is possible. Well, I think love and pity is a very Christian idea. It's probably yeah. it's shared um, among all uh, Christian uh, nations. Especially Orthodox, I would say. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you very much for the question. Thank you very much, Janet. Uh, we'll, we also have a few comments and questions from seven. We have seven. We have seven in the chat. So let's let's. Well, that's, yeah, that's, that, that's lovely. And um, I, I I'd like to ask Henrietta Foster if you if if you would like to unmute yourself and um, ask the questions and make comments uh, out loud. Okay. Or, okay. Um, um, yes. I, I've just had my booster shot, so I'm feeling a bit weak and feeble, unlike oh. Marina Sveta, I am, but anyway. Um, <laughs> Sympathise. Uh, uh, more, more sympathy, more sympathy. Always good. Um, you know, um, I don't speak Russian. It's the big regret of my life that I don't speak Russian. I know my life would be better if I did speak Russian, but I don't. Um, and I need translations. Um, um, I remember seeing this fantastic BBC film, which was... Um, with D.M. Thomas, himself a Russian translator, yes. um, who um, was following Joseph Brodsky around various kind of flesh pots and conferences in Britain. And at one time, uh, he's translating, he's reading a translation of Mandelstam to an audience of translators in Cambridge. And he starts screaming and says, there's no point in me carrying on. It misses so much of the Russian. I'm going out of my mind um, trying to read this. I'm just going to read it to you in Russian. And if you don't understand, too bad. 
you will, you'll get something out of it. And it's a fantastic moment because you see the frustration of the poet and the frustration of the Russian speaker and the frustration of the audience who actually generally do want to know about this. And I think my problem with Feinstein is, is that I actually don't think she spoke Russian. I think she did that thing that was quite popular in the 60s and the 70s where somebody did a basic translation for her and then her translation was well you should have said that in a way because then her translation is based on what they wrote for her and that that is why it it seems a little anodyne and why it seems and and then of course what Weinstein said at the end was you know I she found her own poetic voice by translating Marina which is kind of crazy really um uh, and, and irrelevant because you know I think um, Marina is a fantastic poet, and I think, and I disagree with your interpretation of the poem. I think it, what she's saying is a very adolescent thing. Maybe most of the women who've already spoken haven't been scorned in love, have had very happy romantic relationships. But she's saying, "God damn it, we had something. We had a relationship. Um, we something, there was something special about our relationship." And you're now with this very ordinary woman, and it's not about snobbery or aristocracy or British classness. I mean, Feinstein was certainly not involved in British aristocracy or class issues. She's saying we had something special and now you're just with some ordinary bog standard woman who, and I think at the end when she says, do you miss me as much as I miss you? That's what the poem is about. The poem is about someone who absolutely cannot believe that a special fantastic love has been sacrificed for a very, uh, an everyday kind of love. And that's what makes her such a great world-class poet. And it's what makes Brodsky wrong, I think in many ways, why we do need to read him, but probably not in Elaine Feinstein's translation. Uh, Henrietta, thank you very much for your opinion and interpretation of the poem. It is precious. Thank you very much. So, but is the line about, do you miss me as much as I miss you in the Russian original? Uh, no, it's it's a bit different. Uh, is it uh, as hard to you with another woman as it is uh, for me with another man? You see, I made my own translation there, but that's what it's that's what Elaine Feinstein says, and that it seems to me is why she's such not Feinstein. Why Marina is such a fantastically modern poet and such a poet that kind of does really understand and, and an adolescent. I mean, she's also a very adolescent person but That's in the right. best kind of way. That's right. Yes, thank you very much. Hello, yeah. I was just going to make a comment. Uh, my, oh, Marie, you, you know it, that uh, Elaine Feinstein didn't know Russian at that time very well, but she was in the University of uh, Essex uh, together with Angela Livingstone. Mm. And it was Angela who did uh, her, her uh, first uh, word for word translations. Not, not only her, uh, well, a couple of oh, other. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. But, but, but mainly yeah. Angela Livingstone, that's absolutely right. Mm. Thank you very much for mentioning that. Yes, and but Angela, yeah. of course, I'm sure understood Svitaeva very well, yeah? And uh, I, I think that every poet has um, um, their own right, you know, to interpret, yeah? And to write uh, 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 what they read in the original, yeah? It's, it's just Ellen Feinstein's interpretation, yeah? And she's a good poet herself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yes, but, but that's wrong, of course. That's wrong, of course, because it's not being true to the original. Um, and it is, you know, a poet making her own version of it. And I'm not really interested in reading Elaine Feinstein's version of a Russian poet. I'm much more interested in reading the Russian poet. I mean, I'm sorry, I, I find that morally very questionable. <laughs> but but you said you, you don't read Russian, yes? No, 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 I know. I'm going to have to learn Russian. I see, um, right. But, but, no, but I find that wrong. Other translations, yeah, you, oh, that's yes. the whole point. Yeah, usually it, it helps a lot to read multiple translations. Yes, I yeah? agree. And with then you can uh, form a view, yeah, a different view. <clears throat> but I would you say know, the same thing was true about Elaine Feinstein's book on, on her. I mean, and, and on, on Akhmatova as well. They're very- no, I, I agree, yeah, I agree. They're very <laughs> about her, really. I mean- mm -hmm. Well, you know this famous joke about translations. They are either fidel or belle, like like women, mm. but but uh, they are never fidel. I'm afraid. 
even if they are not bell. Mm. <laughs> it, 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 it is difficult to, to, to talk about, yeah, being true or, no, or not true, yeah. It, translation is a, a creative act, yeah, and if we consider it in this respect, yeah, then we have to respect the translator, yeah. <clears throat> Yes, but the translator has to respect the original writer because they're not an equal partner. They well, really aren't an it, equal it's partner. It's debatable. It's debatable. Uh -huh. if, if we agree, yes, it, it is a creative act. Yeah, it may have a different kind of impetus, but, but still, we have to take it as a work of literature in its own right. Yeah? So, so I agree with you. Yeah, I would rather, yeah, I don't find it perfect. Yeah, Alien Feinstein's translation. Yeah, but it, it is a translation. Yeah, <clears throat> and it, it is her translation. <clears throat> Yeah, so her name is mentioned, and that's why she has her right to be visible and to uh, alter the meaning uh, in her own way. Mm -hmm. Well, it is indeed a very debatable topic. Yeah. So <laughs> therefore, let's move to the next question. Thank you very <laughs> yeah. much for your observation, Henriette. It's really, really interesting to hear uh, your yeah, perspective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so um, Ben wrote in chat, Ben, would you like to read your question and your comment as well? Um, um, I, I, I don't think I really need to just because it, it, was, it was engaging with something that was said earlier. And um, I see that uh, Terasia, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, has asked a much more uh, inter, inter, has, has left a much more interesting comment below mine, so I think we should move on to that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Nice. Uh, so, Theresa, would you like to read your your question? Okay, I will read it then. <laughs> um, Thank you so. Um, thank you for such a thought thought provoking presentation. I don't understand why Feinstein translates, "quote Even the memory of me will be a floating island, the memory and then douche with spirit." Um, it sounds wrong to me, and it's only the beginning. So, <laughs> I think that the biggest transformation of the poem is from impersonal structures connoting passivity to very active personal constructions. I appreciate very much your analysis of this aspect. For me only the direct speech is in, in inverted commas stresses the first person. Dom si bien I do isn't the first person more typical of love poems in English. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Very accurate and uh, very good uh, comments. Uh, even the memory of me be a floating island, the memory. Well, uh, as far as the word spirits is concerned, uh, no, as far as the word dusha is concerned, I was very much interested how uh, uh, this word is translated into uh, English. And by the way, uh, in, in, in uh, the British literature, uh, British translators and American translators do it differently. Well, the Americans, they... Uh, mm, quite often use the word soul, while uh, the British translators uh, seem to avoid it. So if it is in prose, if they come across this word in prose, in Russian prose, and, and Russian literature is full of dusha, because it is, well, really our major, major value. And uh, uh, so if it is prose, uh, mostly translators just omit it, because you, you can meet several times uh, a page uh, this word is mentioned in Tolstoy, for example. So mostly it is omit, omitted by, by, by the British translators or converted like here as spirits. Why not souls? Uh, so, uh, once I even found a translation ghost, which is not dusha at all. And I asked my friends uh, whom, whom I mentioned to you why uh, the British translators tend to avoid the word soul when they translate from, from, from the Russian. And they made the suggestion that probably it is because uh, it is, uh, well, it has so strong uh, religious connotations in, in the English language. And it sounds too loud, well, you see, like the word Rodina, for example, motherland. Uh, 
which is also never translated into English as uh, motherland. And Svitaeva likes this word as well. And it is translated as homeland, which is a totally different thing again. So uh, that, that's a very interesting question about uh, uh, soul and, and spirits, dusha spirits, why, why it is translated as spirits. I don't know. But, uh, well, I hope the, uh, the British audience can explain it to me because I still wonder. Since, uh, well, the uh, two language dictionary, it suggests that you translate dusha as soul. Can can I um, can I just say something about that? Yeah. So I think that, that that's a really interesting comment, and it, it it seems to me that part of the problem with with that line, both for Feinstein as the translator and for English readers, it, it's not just that dusha in in Russian has completely different connotations than spirit or soul in in English, and, and actually. So is completely inappropriate translation, at least to a modern day audience, because that I mean that that just sounds like the music genre. Yeah. To to me, so, um, yeah. I mean, spirit is a bit is a bit more appropriate, but it's it still has a, a kind of a different meaning, and it you're, it doesn't have any any of the kind of so the the deeper social cultural implications that it does that Dusha does in in Russian. But I think that the, the the problem the other problem here is that. We're talking about the the, the the spirits of two ex lovers. Now, in, in at least in a, in a, talking about a heterosexual relationship, in English we would think of the spirits of a man and a woman of of, of two okay. lovers as being. The, we we would think of of their spirits as being gendered as male and female. So the the, the idea of, of them being siostri is is it's just is it's just extremely weird. I think to to English readers, so I think that's kind of why it's difficult to translate. But anyway, that that's just. I see. I never thought about it. By the way, I, mean, I, 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 might, I might I might be wrong about that, and and we obviously we have many native English speakers who are probably going to turn turn their microphones on now and tell me that I'm talking rubbish. But that that was just what uh, occurred to me then. So. Right. Thank you very know. much. Thank you very much. Is, if, if, if anyone wants to um, make their comment, please do. Uh, so Michael wrote in the chat that yes. I know what you mean about soul, and yet we do speak of soulmates. Soulmates, you do. Mm -hmm. Yes. And actually, well, I personally working with 19th, late 19th, early 20th century translations, I can't say the word soul was avoided, uh, particularly in the translations of Constance Garnett. Probably the, the word soul used less often as it is used in original versions, but still it is used. Um, so, and that's why there was this almost cliche about Russian soul um, when um, the Russian literature became particularly popular um, at, the, at the beginning of 20th century in Britain. So. Yes, yeah, so, uh, the, the fact that this cliche appeared probably signifies that uh, soul was translated, or at least <laughs> there was an attempt to translate uh, this concept into English. Well, yes, Anna, th thank you very much for this remark. Uh, but uh, I, I really made an investigation into, into uh, uh, the word soul, uh, the word dusha is translated into, into English. And uh, by the way, I, I uh, uh, tried to, to find uh, the word soul in the English poetry and I failed. Well, uh, the only period when it was widely used was the 17th century poetry of John Donne yeah, William Blake probably. Right? Not, not uh, in the period of Romanticism. No. No, but in the 70th, uh, seven, uh, 17th century. So, which means that it is, uh, it has this religious connotation, probably, right? Very strong one, which is avoided in, in contemporary society, which is predominantly atheistic. 
you know i i will i will i will give you a word maria just want yeah, i wanted to, to mention okay. that i'm i'm really interested in translations of russian orthodox hymns into english yes. and that's the place where the yes. world, yes. world the word soul found <laughs> its own <place. laughs> i see i see yeah, Maria, Maria, sorry. I, I, Anna, I, Anna, you saw me nodding my head vigorously. <laughs> the word, uh, first of all, soul is very much used in English religious poetry. That's right. Mm -hmm. The 17th century, definitely. John Donne, definitely. But also the lesser known but very important poet of the 17th, George Herbert. Yeah. Herbert, as he's sometimes pronounced. Yeah, it yeah. appears... It appears in English romantic literature, not necessarily poetry, but appears okay. amongst the novelists, which is why somebody made a comment about the musical dimension of the word soul. That is probably, um, you know, a modern phenomenon, i.e. 20, 20, late 20th century, 21st century mm -hmm. phenomenon. I must say to you that in spoken language, the word soul is used very much in English and mm. no less than by the great English actors. Cumberbatch recently in some interview talked about getting to his soul. Rafe Fiennes, who is a Russophile, we know this, uses the word soul. Actors have no problem using the word soul. I think that's, that's important. In the spoken language, on television I've heard, on you know, chat shows on television, people talking about their soul. It does exist, and it certainly exists in the, in the Church of England. You only have to listen to the liturgies of the English uh, uh, church to hear the word soul. I heard Prince Charles use the word soul recently. But, so but. it's used. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a foreign word. <laughs> if I can, if I can interject, Maria, I think you're right, but there is a big difference between the way that the, the word soul is used in the sort of the popular register, in the way that musicians or actors might use it, and the religious connotations of the word. I see your point, Ben, but I disagree. I'm sorry, uh, because the word is religious, whether you like it or not. It is full of religious connotations. It cannot be removed. One of the things that I certainly saw when Stanislavski uses the word soul and the English and American translators avoid it, he means it in the deep orthodox sense of the word. He was profoundly orthodox. And when Marina Svetkova talks about it being imbued in the Russian culture, Russian culture is mired in orthodoxy, Russian orthodoxy. There's no getting away from it. So it's there. But then again, I would say it's right there also in the English church. You know, the, what is it called? Come on, the Queen of England is the head of, come on, help me someone. I'm, I'm tired, so I can't think. Um, Anglican Church, there it is. The Anglican Church, it mm -hmm. is. It's just that there's a squeamishness is the word I used when I was talking about the problem with using the word soul in Stanislavski. There's a squeamishness in a certain kind of, I don't even know how to put this, so forgive me, I don't have the answer, but I'm certainly puzzled by it. In the kind of, um, amongst British academics, Am I too wrong here, Ben? Uh, they're afraid of the word soul. Well, I'm I'm not the um, soul representative. Uh, no, no pun intended. Of of um, British academia. Well, I'm a British in, academic in, too, in, in, in this audience. But uh, well, okay. Well, if you're 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 an academic too, why are you asking me? <laughs> I'm, I'm, jo I'm joking. I would like to have uh, have this discussion with you to see. You know, I, what I don't. You... I don't think that British academics do have an, an aversion to to the word soul. That, that's a different conversation from whether it's it's an appropriate. All right, fine. Thank you. That's an answer for me. Um, that, that that's that's my, my entirely subjective. Take, which okay, I... it, is, it is it is a response from me which was what i was asking for i wasn't just talking to myself i was asking. Oh, i think maria if i may just hop in i i have no evidence for this but intuitively i empathize with your point the the idea of there being a squeamishness about the soul not the soul per se but no, um, just, maybe, just the word just using just the word it. yeah no the expressiveness implied by using it yeah. the sort of commitment to something vast um, and possibly not empirically definable in any sense, you know, that kind of would to go into sort of cliches about British uh, academia. But I, 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 I can't offer any more than that, just intuitively that feels sensible to me. 
I'm really curious if the reception of Russian culture actually added anything into the usage of the word soul in, in English, because as I said, at the beginning of 20th century, it, Russian culture, Russian literature, and Tolstoy and Dostoevsky were, were a really big thing. So the word soul was used massively. And so, it, yeah, it's interesting if, it, if the usage of this word in Russian texts somehow influenced um, how much used it was by, by British audiences as well. Uh, I think I think I think Anna is correct actually, and the the other thing that occurs to me in answer to uh, Maria's question um, about academics and where they fit into all this is that I I think that Russian soul was for a period of time was the standard translation of of, of Ruska Dusha in uh, how can I say this politely. Um, um, academic works of a certain generation um, that that were sort of general histories, general cultural histories of, of Russia. I'm thinking of a text like James Billington here, for example, works that are, are now considered somewhat dated and old hat. It may therefore be that there is a, a, a generation of Slavists now who grew up reading sort of Svetopolk Mirsky and Billington and these sort of classic cultural historians of Russia and are somewhat averse to using the, the word the talking about, about the Russian soul because that that seems to them a, a rather dated formulation but that's purely speculative again does that make sense to anyone I, th I think the last comment in our chat um, put the, 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 the final stop <laughs> this conversation uh, that the Russian soul was a myth created by French people. <laughs> <laughs> it, it explains everything. I think that's, that's the point where British and Russian cultures meet. Let's blame French people <laughs> for everything. I'm, I'm joking, just in case. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, cultures must meet, mustn't they? Of course. They must. Um, Otherwise, yeah. we would all be sticking into our little holes, you know, like in lockdown, and not speaking <laughs> to the world. But that's where we would be. Yeah, well, but there, there, are, is, there are souls in British poems. I've just put the last there time. Are, Keith, word, for Keith. example. Keith, for example, uses yeah. the word soul. Shelley yeah. uses the word soul. Yeah. That's why I said in romantic literature, it was used without fear. But I think perhaps the British definition of soul is more melancholy. It's not something we see That's as right. romance. It's something we might see as religion or we might see as pain, not necessarily as romantic in a different way from Russia. Mm -hmm. The Russian view of soul It's probably, I mean, that would be my feeling. I think another problem with the word soul um, and spirit is soul can mean different things. Mm. It can be, you know, what's left. If you if you believe in an afterlife, what's left after you die and your mm. body has decayed, or oh, oh dear, disappeared. <laughs> it it seems it seems something went wrong with the connection with the internet connection. Yeah. Um, Henrietta, are you there? Can yes, you I'm there. I'm there. Yes, yeah, even. Is it, was... It's Janet who was speaking, though, not me. I'm sorry, it was, it, was, it was Janet. Sorry, I was confused. Right. But but read the Keats. I mean, the Keats, it is about sadness. It's about loss. The soul, the soul is something we Brits see as something about loss or as a trophy. It's mm -hmm. not used in the same way as it's Dusha. The, sorry, was I speaking with Oh, no, you did. You're back. You're back. Yeah, I, d I didn't actually touch anything, but I don't, so I don't know what you heard or not. But what I was saying is that the, the meaning of soul, sorry if I'm repeating myself, but the meaning of soul in English uh, and to some extent in Russian, um, there are different meanings. There's the religious one, what's left after your body's decay, or it's doesn't have to have religious connotations. And the presence in English, the word spirit and soul, you've got duh in Russian as well, but where they mean the same thing and where they don't, as you know, is a general problem with translation. I think that's part of the trickiness. When, right. yeah. 
that's right. I just wonder, um, sorry, Marina, can I ask a question if you've still got time? You're welcome. Um, uh, the, um, thank you. The, this question, um, um, uh, I've been teaching the English audience for many years here in Britain, and uh, including some topics on literature, and we were discussing Akhmatova and uh, Tsvetaeva and Pasternak, and uh, what uh, um, my conclusion is from our discussions that very often Tsvetaeva um, is not accepted, uh, not on the poetic grounds, but because uh, uh, because of her biography that uh, she was uh, quite a poor mother, and uh, it puts people off. Ooh. I just wonder um, how to explain that. Of course, Akhmatova was not uh, the best mother in the world either, uh, but still, attitude towards Akhmatova is slightly more positive than to Tsvetaeva. And uh, I wouldn't put it due to the translations, but due to the personality. I wonder whether you can help me and give me some argument <laughs> to defend her. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, question. Well, uh, once, once I was in Marina Tsvetaeva's museum, one of the museums uh, in, in uh, the Rhine, Russia, uh, the one in Boris Oglebsky Periwork in, in Moscow. And there was a guided tour for children, uh, for school children. And uh, uh, well, the guide was speaking about different men in Svitaeva's biography. And she said, well, she, she was in love with this man and then she was in love with that man and then in that man. So do not judge her, she said. When you, you, you get up, you will understand. <laughs> <laughs> so probably something like that could be said. Well, you see, life is a different thing. And uh, a poet uh, differs from uh, ordinary people, right? We, we cannot judge uh, poets. That's, that's my answer. Uh, right. if, but in, in modernism, in, in modernism, everything and in Silver Age, all the poets actually uh, uh, wrote about their lives. So their life was their poetry. So you can't uh, um, sort of uh, disintegrate uh, that and separate their personal lives from poetry. It's all based on their experience. So it's very difficult. And I teach to the grown-ups, not, not uh, quite sort of, <laughs> um, well, a lot of them over, well, the audience, a lot of them over 50s and 60s even. Yeah, so that, that's, they're really grown up, so really. <laughs> <laughs> so for them, it is very difficult to accept such, such, such a behavior. Yeah. Well, then, uh, well, well, you have to state that uh, poets, uh, they differ from ordinary people, right? We, we cannot ordinary judge. Ordinary people. Mm -hmm. I'm then, sorry, I'm sorry, I, re I really I'm don't think that's you. true. I think I think that Sotaeva lived at a certain time when parents' reaction and interaction with their children was an awful lot less, whether you were Russian, British, French, German, American. They had servants or they didn't have servants. They had a different relationship. And if people accuse her of being a, a bad mother, I mean, she kept the family together. She worked okay there was the child who died but a lot of people lost child children during the civil war and um, i think she tried so hard to keep that family together and she was the one who worked her, her fingers to bone her husband was really a bit of a dilettante in, in all in, honestly and i i feel that i mean i think it's irrelevant to her poetry and if people don't like it because she thinks she's a bad mother well i mean shakespeare wasn't exactly a great father but i mean that seems to me kind of a crazy idea to think that people don't like her because they think she was bad in the maternal front and I don't actually think she was I'm sorry I I think she she tried her very best to keep that family together and indeed she went back to Russia to follow that family and also as I put in the chat Moore her son was a bloody nightmare I mean he was the ultimate hideous adolescent I mean really I mean poor guy but nevertheless he was impossible yeah, I, I agree. Tsvetaeva worked very hard to keep, to feed this family and to keep mm. the roof under their head. Yeah. And I just quoted Pushkin, you remember, когда не требует поэта к священной жертве Аполлон, в заботы суетлого света он молодушно погружен. И среди людей, и среди, I forgot, и среди людей ничтожных, быть может, всех ничтожней он. 
so yeah, we, we cannot project yeah, the personality of the, yeah. and as I said, the, the, yeah, I, I heard a lot of this argument, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's what I didn't abandon, I think, yeah. yes, it, no. it's difficult to tell exactly what happened, because she put right. them for a while, yeah, into that institution, because it was the only way for her to feed them, really, yeah, mm -hmm. and she thought that they will be fed, yeah. um, but as I said, I... Ben, yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Can, can I um, just um, interject as, as co-host here that the, the, as, uh, this has been a, a fascinating discussion, but I, I think we do need to draw it to a close fairly soon for, for time reasons, because uh, people have to go make, make their dinner and so forth. Um, so we, we've got one last question, I think, from Farasia in the chat, and then... I think we should all say thank you once again to uh, Marina Svitkova for a really, really fascinating presentation. And um, uh, Therese, would you are you still un unable to speak, or shall I read your question for you? Um, so, um, uh, Marina, could you talk a bit about the right. reception of Svitaeva as, as a playwright, as, especially about Fyodor? Well, unfortunately, I didn't do any investigation about, uh, about your plays. So, unfortunately, very sorry. I cannot say something. Uh, or it's better to say anything. <laughs> I can say anything <laughs> on that subject because I was interested in reception of Tsvitayo's poetry, uh, short poems and narrative poems, <clears throat> but not, not plays. Excuse me. Next time, probably. Well, if, if, you're, if you're willing to speak to the Anglo Russian Research Network again, um, I think we'd all be, be delighted to have you back, Marina. So, so uh, on that note, I'm just going to stop the recording. No.